so soon? Oh no, sorry, I think I'm looking at the wrong dimension. <laughs> Yeah, that's better. <laughs> Welcome once again, my human friends. I remain your host, the fantabulous Funky M, seer of things. And today, I see the next chapter of our mutant-thon, X-Men 2. Released in 2003, X-Men 2 picks up the story as Wolverine discovers his history at Alkali Lake Military Base. But the base's old commander has dark plans for mutant kind. Arriving a year after the first Spider-Man movie, X-Men 2 was now part of a burgeoning superhero landscape. So come with me, my human friends, as we continue the mutant-thon into its first sequel, X-Men 2. It's an ordinary day in the White House. But this day is about to become extra ordinary as a blue-skinned teleporting mutant has a rather pointy message for Mr. President. Mutant lives matter too, you know. That's all we're saying here. Then maybe we shouldn't be saying with a knife to the US President if you catch my drift. Back in New York, Jean Grey is not having a good day. Made all the worse by the news of our blue friend. Wolverine returns from his own personal mission, finding only an empty gate where the Alkali Lake military base once stood. Of course, there is still a base there, but we just don't see it yet. And it is actually underground and inside the dam and all that. But anyway, next scene. Cut to Boston, where Storm and Jean follow a lead and meet the blue-skinned would-be assassin, Nightcrawler. But a routine visit to Magneto's plastic prison goes horribly wrong, and Professor X is kidnapped. And worse, a surprisingly well-armed group invades the X-Mansion that very night. Wolverine does his best to fight these invaders. He also manages to get some of the other students to safety. That leads to a subplot later on. But we'll get to that. But then he comes face to face with... Colonel William Stryker. You know, it's funny. I look at that guy. You know what I see? I see a preacher. Like a real Southern Baptist revivalist. Calvinist fire and brimstone. Wrath of God, Old Testament kind of preacher. It's just his aura. It's like flames of hellfire. A real, God loves, man kills kind of thing. Mystique has been hiding in plain sight, hoping to find the whereabouts of Magneto's plastic prison. And once she gets those whereabouts, she enacts a plan to free her friend and spiritual leader. Hey man, nobody ever said that espionage is all glitz and glamour. Which necessarily results in a rather gruesome, if interesting, death. Oh, the ferocity! Huh? 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 Ugh. Oh, oh, oh! Thanks, Rob! Robin Croydon. At least somebody gets me. Wolverine escapes the mansion, along with Rogue, Pyro, and Iceman. Arriving in Boston, they hide out with Iceman's family. But Iceman's scumbag little brother calls the cops. Lucky for our heroes, Storm, Jean, and Nightcrawler pick them up in the X-Jet. Which leads to further troubles, as the jet is intercepted by two fighters. Storm and Jean use their abilities to defend the jet. But Jean's not been having a good week. Bit of a weird moment to bring it up, I'm sure, but if you ever wondered why Jean Grey doesn't have a codename of her own, it's because she decided she'd pick her own codename when she was about 12 or 13. <laughs> yeah, she decided that Marvel Girl would be her codename. Luckily, Magneto's week has steadily improved. 
and our heroes set up camp in the woods. And of course, catch up those of us who came in late to the plot. You see, the thing about Stryker, he's got a son himself, Jason. Only Jason's a mutant, powerful telepath, specialises in illusions. It's what killed Mama Stryker if you get my drift. Yeah. He caused illusions in her brain till she took a knife to her temples trying to dig him out. <laughs> Nasty. That's why Stryker wants rid of the mutants. So he's built himself a fake cerebro, or a reproduction cerebro or whatever, to get to Professor X in there so that he can find all of the mutants and wipe them out. The next morning, we return to Alkali Lake to find what Wolverine alone couldn't. And none too soon as Stryker's son has charged the kidnapped Professor X with a mission to find all of the mutants. Mystique, posing as Wolverine, opens the way for our heroes. Of course, the way I hear it, better part of hacking's just social engineering anyhow. At least it used to be back in the 70s when hacking and freaking and phone stuff was the big thing. I mean, if you were someone who could do that in person, you'd be set for life. Wolverine separates from the group and rediscovers the lab that spawned him. But he'll have to get past Lady Deathstrike, which he manages thanks to a vat of liquid adamantium. So yeah, this needs to be said. Stroke has been experimenting on mutants for years. He's even used his son's spinal fluid to hypnotise people. You know, like uh, Nightcrawler in the first scene. With the knife attack on the president, Magneto spilled the beans on what Cerebro was and how to make one. You know, he helped make it with Xavier back in the day. And he captured Cyclops same time as Professor X. Decides to use him as his pawn. Of course, Jean Grey snaps Cyclops out of it. But not before causing some pretty heavy collateral damage. Which is very not good in a dam. Back at the replica Cerebro, there's been a change of plan. And really, why wouldn't Magneto take this opportunity, this open goal, to destroy all of the non-mutant humans in the world? I mean, yeah, there's nearly 7 billion of them, and I don't think even Professor X could concentrate so hard to kill all of them. But hey, whatever. Seeing as the X-Men are on the side of mutant-human relations, though, Nightcrawler takes a leap of faith and Storm puts a chill on the machinations of Magneto. <laughs> Exit our heroes to our waiting X-Jet. But oh dear, the dam breaks, and the jet's systems won't respond. It falls to Jean Grey to put the perfect ending on this terrible week. Kinda sad, really. Taking one for the team. And so our movie ends as Professor X addresses the President himself. And life returns to normal at the X Mansion. But Jean Grey may not be quite dead. Another one down. And how was it? Well, I think this one deserves its spot on the Newton Thon team as well. Let's not mince words here. This movie is much more complex than the first. The plot is not simple. Wolverine's looking for answers, Colonel Stryker's looking to end all mutants, Jean Grey is having trouble with her powers. Not to mention the secondary character arcs of Rogue, Iceman and Pyro, but director Brian Singer manages to string together these separate strands and keep everything from feeling disjointed. The performances, again, are the main thing. Of course, are Shakespearean thesps. Patrick Stewart and Sir Ian McKellen dominate with their performances, and Hugh Jackman's Wolverine is mostly taken up with fights and grimacing, but the most tender affections are in the romance of Sean Ashmore's Bobby Drake, Iceman, and Anna Paquin's Rogue. And this was where the effects started to get good, as the CGI doesn't look especially ropey, even after all this time. The flow this time around centres less on a single character, and tries to give more space to the variety of characters. Wolverine, Rogue, Iceman, Pyro, though new edition Nightcrawler sadly gets far too little screen time for all of Alan Cummings' suffering in the makeup chair, though what we get of him is good. 
Overall though, the seeds of this greatest of mysteries, Wolverine's true past, are sown here. And even to this day, the movie canon still leaves us with questions. But as to the movie itself, it's a fun, self-contained blockbuster, and though the formula has begun to take root somewhat, it's at least entertaining enough to keep our attention. Yes, a fine movie indeed. This is your humble host, the magnificent mutant Funky M, inviting you to join me next week to cap this trilogy with X-Men 3, The Last Stand. Until then, see you around, humans.